So basically, what changed when we spoke uh, in April till now? Look, it's, it's a major transaction. It's the biggest one in 20 years for the company. And this is accretive. It's accretive right the way down to $40 a barrel, realized prices, and $2.25 Henry Hub. We are very happy with the deal that we got away today. I think there's huge upside potential in the numbers that we laid out with investors this morning. Uh, we have a midstream business comes with this in terms of Eagleford and Haynesville. Uh, we get two premium positions in Haynesville and Eagleford. And of course, we get access to the Permian, which is a sort of key part of this transaction. Uh, um, and we see potential, huge upside potential for us going forward. So this is a great deal for the company. It's a great deal for our upstream, and it's a great deal for shareholders. Uh, so, Brian, what was interesting, though, is that many analysts had expected all these assets to go from to about $9 billion. And you said in the interview with me earlier that it was 40 to 50 players were in there bidding for the assets. Why did you have to pay $10.5 billion? Well, I, I mean, I don't know if we were the highest price. I think we were the cleanest bid of all the bids that BHP had because it was a straight, clean transaction with BP. I think other bids may have been more complicated or had more partners involved, and there were seven packages. Um, we think $10.5 billion. We believe the value, and we know the value is significantly above that, just from the assets we farmed into in Eagleford back into 2014 where we were able to double the flow rates with the team that we brought into our own Lower 48 business four or five years ago, Dave Lawler and his management team from Sandridge. So we, we can see the potential. We've been able to realize that in the assets that we've looked at. And as I said, there's major upside. And Dave Lawler, obviously oil is in his blood with uh, his brother leading uh, Chesapeake. But let's talk about how you're going to be funding this. How much equity are you going to have to issue to pay for this? So it's $10.5 billion. It'll be five and a quarter billion dollars of cash at the end of October if we close as scheduled. And then it'll be six monthly payments of the balance divided across the six months, which as of today, we intend to issue equity or sell treasury shares to fund as part of the transaction. We'll then look to divest five to six billion dollars of assets, predominantly in our upstream. And that will enable us to also then buy back five to six billion dollars of stock Hmm. Um, as we fully integrate this transaction into the company. Uh, what assets are you looking to sell? Uh, as you asked me last time, Kelly, we don't normally talk about specific assets. Um, we have a tail portfolio. There is no question that the assets we've just acquired are a major uplift for our upstream business. Um, and we will look at things which are non-strategic and we believe can be of more value to others around the globe and we will work our way through that. What I would say is our M&A teams over the last eight years have now transacted over $100 billion worth of transactions. Um, so we'll be getting the data roams locked and loaded uh, next week now that we've announced this transaction and we will start to proceed on the sales process. Uh, would you be selling any of the assets that you're getting from BHP? Uh, we're not going to comment on the specific assets. We'll look to see how we integrate and optimize. Uh, we need to get into the, we know the Eagleford and Haynesville pretty well. Mm -hmm. We need to get into the Permian to see what we can find. Um, and then we'll look to optimize across the whole piece. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, the synergy wise, you obviously have lots of synergies in the Eagleford as well as the Haynesville. The confusion I think of some analysts right now is you don't have a lot of synergies in the Permian. So how quickly can you really move there or how quickly can you understand that basin? Yeah, so we've, we've come out today and made very clear that we, and I think it's a conservative number, that there's $350 million worth of annual synergies that we'll be able to drive through with this transaction. Uh, actually, BHP's operations in the last couple of years have been pretty good. We think there's more to do there, and we know that from the assets that we've farmed into historically. Uh, we'll also be able to optimize uh, our workforce as we think about the activity. And then, of course, we now also, these assets will get access to BP supply and trading operation, our logistics. And these assets come with quite a significant midstream position in both Haynesville and Eagleford. So there is plenty of optimization. As I said, the $350 million synergy number is a pretty conservative number. Well, and, and just to pivot on that too, you know, in talking to BHP in general about their assets, something that they want to move towards is their operations becoming more of a manufacturing kind of asset, manufacturing type of company. Uh, do you feel that BP does that and can bring that to the Permian? Yeah, that's exactly what we have today. So if you look five years ago, our lower 48 competitively was disadvantaged in terms of performance, in terms of F&D costs, operating costs, the performance on the will side. 
we brought in a team externally led by Dave Law. And as you say, Dave has, has all in his blood. And I spent this morning with Dave as we talked to investors. Uh, they're pretty excited about this transaction. And there is no question that there is major upside that they will be able to bring. But effectively, they have produced now a manufacturing business for us in Lower 48. And that's exactly the way we describe it. How aggressively then, how aggressively then will you be allocating capital? Well, it will be within the overall upstream frame, and I think it's important that what we've announced today with this transaction is we will maintain the capital discipline of 15 to 17 billion dollars. So that ain't going to change. So what we will do is within the 13 to 14 that we allocated to upstream, we're already running that through capital efficiency down at 12 billion dollars today. So we will comfortably be able to accommodate these assets inside that frame, and then it's a choice for Bernard and Dave as to how they then allocate capital across the whole of the upstream. What I would say is these are pretty attractive assets and therefore will attract uh, capital going forward. Right, but on the flip side, uh, it's an interesting time to be buying. I know you mentioned the midstream assets a bunch of times, but obviously the difference between uh, prices in Permian, oil prices and prices over in Houston has a big dislocation because of takeaway capacity issues. So does that motivate you to take a slower development uh, feel for this, yep. considering you kind of have like a year and yep. a half with which to play with until the takeaway capacity yep. gets resolved? Oh, that's a great point, Kelly. And I think what, what Dave and his team will be looking at is there is no question there is near-term value in the Eaglefoot. If you look at the Midland prices today, which are trading about $13 below WTI, if you look at the forward curve out of the fourth quarter 2020, they're, they're trading at minus $1.50, which is exactly your point, that, that the market is anticipating that logistics comes in and then we'll be able to evacuate that. We also have significant oil and trading businesses already around that location. So... Uh, we're comfortable that we'll have the contracts and logistics in place and then Dave will time his capital investments mm -hmm. to make sure that we hit the sweet spot in terms of uh, realizations. Well, as you know, uh, the equity, your stock is down and you've been on the call and you basically said uh, a few times the market's not realizing how good the deal is. In talking to analysts, it feels what the issue for them is, is that your balance sheet leverage is already at the higher end of your 20 to 30 percent guidance. You've also wanted to reduce debt uh, throughout 2018 and you're still having a buyback program. So how can you achieve all of this while adding on this ten and a half billion dollar acquisition? Well, well, we're right in the middle of two Q results, so I'll, I'll, I'll simply talk about what we said at 1Q. And 1Q was that we expected debt and gearing to come down through this year. Uh, we've planned this year based on $50 to $55 a barrel. Mm -hmm. The oil price has been significantly above that, and therefore you anticipate that would drive free cash flow. Uh, we've said debt coming down at 1Q was a priority. Equally, we announced uh, last night as part of the transaction that as the board met yesterday, they wanted to signal that we were ready now to also distribute to shareholders. So our dividend was increased by 2.5% last night um, in line with this. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to look at how we see net debt will naturally come down as the year progresses. This deal will be fully accommodated within our 20 to 30 percent gearing band. And I think that's an important message for the market. Not only are we staying disciplined on capital, we're staying disciplined on the balance sheet. So what do you feel like investors and analysts are just not understanding about that? Because you're being very clear, yet it's clear that the leverage issue is still a problem for them. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not sure it is actually, Kelly. I think, I think what, what you're seeing in the market right now is in the same way we, we laid out our strategy um, back in February of last year, we've had five quarters where the market has started to react now that they can start to see those cash flows coming through. As the new projects, the seven new projects came on stream last year, debt will naturally decline down. And actually, our average cost of borrowing for BP is about 2%. So frankly, where the debt and gearing figures are, we don't feel that very leveraged. Yeah, but buying you $40 billion worth of debt. And that doesn't now seem to be paid down. No, well, as I said at the end of 1Q, debt will naturally come down at these higher oil prices as will gearing as the year progresses. I'm in a closed period, so I can't tell you specifically about what happens at 2Q, but at the end of 1Q, we were very clear. We would expect right. debt to start to come down. But and I should also say the Macondo liabilities are pretty well now um, um, mapped out for the next two to three years. So we will be able to um, see the gearing and debt will naturally come down. Right, but if part of that is also based on an oil price expectation. If the oil price doesn't live up to that expectation, how can you reassure investors you're not going to have to go back to the market, issue more debt, issue more equity? Well, the oil price assumption is 50 to $55. Um, Brent, 
So I think that's a pretty conservative assumption for certainly what the short to midterm, if I go out from today to say the middle of next year looks like in terms of where oil prices are and they're trading $20 above that number. So I don't think that's a major concern right now. Uh, and sort of to move forward then, um, would you be happy with this Permian position now? Are you done with m and or are you be looking to add? Look, we'll need to absorb this deal. We'll need to get the deal closed. That won't close till the end of October. We'll need to assimilate the assets in and we will look at all options. The ultimate test for us is, are these transactions accretive for shareholders and do they add value? We've increased our target out to 2021 by a billion dollars off the back of what is effectively a net $5 billion investment. Um, I think we'll continue to look at assets going forward, but it has to be within the capital frame that we've laid out, which we are going to stay disciplined mm -hmm. on out to 2021. So as you look to add value, uh, what do you anticipate now being the biggest hurdle to adding value in the Permian? I think you've raised it already, Kelly. I mean, I think the key, we, we already know what we can do uh, with these assets. We know, we know what we've achieved in Eagleford and Haynesville already. It's going to be about the infrastructure and logistics that you talked about earlier going in. And as you said earlier, we'll look to pace our investments to make sure that we hit the sweet spot on those.